Hi, I'm Jim Rosenthal. Welcome to Eye on Art. Hi, and I'm Carla Santia. Together we're going to be visiting some local artists. We're going to be venturing into their studios and seeing exactly what is happening in the Pioneer Valley and in some instances in southern New England. Uh, we'll be exploring the art world in this area. And I'm hoping that uh, you as our audience is going to have as much fun as Jim and I are going to have. I'm really looking forward to this. The initial interest level that we've had uh, in this project has been really exciting. Uh, a lot of artists are volunteering to be on our show and uh, I can't wait to visit their studios and see them in action. I have to agree. I think the artists are particularly excited about this. I know some of them have open studios, but this is going to give us an opportunity and give them an opportunity to um, open their doors so that a large audience will be able to experience uh, their creative process and see exactly where it is that they all work and create in. Sounds great. Uh, today we're going to be visiting Don Blanton and, and here we are in his studio. Uh, Don is going to be telling us about his work in the Springfield area both as a teacher and as an artist. I think uh, Don is a very successful artist. Uh, he's a very strong sculptor in this area. I think that's really where um, his strength lies. But he's also very involved in the community and bringing art to the masses, which I think is uh, just a wonderful trait. So um, here in our first show, we're going to now begin with Don Blanton. And we hope that after this show, you'll join us for many others. So let's start. Let's do. Good morning. We're here today with the um, Don Blanton in his studio in Springfield. And we're going to be talking to Don about the work that he does, not only his work in art, but his community work. Um, thank you very much for having us this morning, Don. It's You're really welcome, a pleasure Carla. to be here. Uh, what we want to focus on first is your work as an artist. So give us a little bit of background about that, the various media that you work in, and uh, the pleasure. Thank you. First of all, I work in stone. I enjoy probably sculpting more so than painting. And I am more of a sculptor and painter because that's what the public says. And I <laughs> kind of have to agree with it. <laughs> Go ahead, Carol. I will. Actually, I will also agree. I think that your strength is, is very much in stone alabaster, although you are good at other medias. Um, tell us exactly what it was that got you interested in becoming an artist and, and why you decided to take this path rather than perhaps something in terms of uh, teaching full-time. I don't honestly believe I had a choice in it. It's the sort of thing where if you feel, I, I mean that, <laughs> I didn't have a choice because I was just as far back as I can remember. That's all I've ever wanted to do. And I pursued exactly what I'm doing, and I, that's it. I love it. Um, well, this, this is good. <laughs> was there any particular role model that you had as you were growing up? Was there an artist or somebody in your immediate family that perhaps helped to um, feed this Great question. desire? Great question. My mother. <laughs> <laughs> All mothers would love to hear this, right? <laughs> True. Yes. My, mo my mother it was very artistic, mm -hmm. whether it was culinary arts, cooking, quilting. She just had a high, as far as eye-hand coordination with whatever. Mm -hmm. and she could really make some beautiful things. So I'd have to say my mother. Well, this is interesting because you refer to her being an artist in um, ways that most people don't think of as art, and that is culinary. Yes. Or Although quilting is uh, definitely one of those art forms that's very textural. Um, and in the textile industry. But, um, so she had a great bearing on, on your decision to become an artist? Oh, without a doubt. Also poetry. She loved poetry and was quite versed in poet. All poets. Yeah. As I discover, yes. you are also, and that with a lot of the um, work that you do in stone, yes. you have this inspiration to also express yourself um, in a verbal way with a poem or a piece of prose that sort of goes with the expression of the stone. At least I hope it goes with it. That I, I have found <laughs> that it has, and I hope Thank that you. maybe we can put some of this uh, writing of yours with a piece that you're actually working on. 
Um, we have this piece in front of us that is a work in progress. And I think as somebody who doesn't um, create anything artistically in, in any kind of media, it's very fascinating to see how an artist actually takes a raw material and then creates something from it. So tell us a little bit about this piece that you're working on. I think the first thing you have to do is have some concept of what it is you want to create. Uh, whether it's a feeling or whether it's a sketch that you had, and you say, I kind of like the way it looks. I'd like to trans, you know, transfer that mm -hmm. to, to the stone. Mm -hmm. The feeling here is a feeling of embracing someone. And the body here, if you, you can't tell with the powdery look here, but the, subject will, the subjects will be a man and his arm around either a child or his partner's wife. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, but what I've already established is exactly where everything will be before I touch the stone, period. The stone dictates that the head has to, of course, be here, shoulders coming up. And as it comes around, you can see that this shoulder is lowered, arm coming in and under. And I can see, visualize the entire piece from this point. How about you? Well, I can see it because now you, you've begun to work with it. Um, I have often heard from uh, people who work in, in stone or wood that they live with this raw piece of material first in order to be able to hear what it's saying to them. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I, I find it to be very interesting um, how it speaks to the artist and then takes its form. Well, we have to be kind of careful about saying it speaks to us, but well. in a way it does. <laughs> it does. What happens, and it's true, I'll take a piece of stone and put it by my bed or on a shelf where I can see it, mm -hmm. and then I, I, I can s sort of feel exactly what it's saying as far as exact what form it will take from there. And it's so much easier Case in point, I, I was creating, I'd been commissioned to do an elephant for someone. Mm -hmm. The elephant itself was there, and I decided, after looking at it, there was a part where I could almost see the figure of a boy embracing the elephant's leg. Mm -hmm. And of course, I put it in, and it was, it was there. It was, no doubt about it, after I started the next day with it, it was exactly what it was. It was meant to be. So if you refer to speaking to you, yes, the stone did more or less say that's what has to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's exactly what I what I mean that it, it, yes. it speaks. I, I think that um, it's whatever it is, the composition, the grain, the form, even sometimes the weight that Absolutely. gives you the inspiration. Absolutely. I was being somewhat facetious because I know it. <laughs> even though there are times it may speak to you, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was using speak in yes. a, a very yes. loose manner. I mean, um, not that we you know, that we expect that you're hearing <laughs> voices coming from stone, but that it's, it's very much, yes. I think, what may happen when an artist is working with a blank canvas. Um, yes, and now, you do also work with canvas, and you also work with paper. Um, tell us a little bit about the difference and how that <coughs> speaks to you as opposed to stone. You know, I don't, I don't, I can't really say it's a big difference. As far as speaking to you, as far as painting versus sculpting, the same feeling that you have for, a, if you want to paint a landscape, for example, that mm -hmm. same power that you may receive for looking at mountains, so on and so forth, you, inside, it's no different than the feeling you have when you're creating something on the stone, whether it be a body or dolphins or whatever. There's not much difference. It's just a different source of inspiration. When you talk about a different source of inspiration, I'm, I'm thinking of myself as not really being an artist, um, that I, c I can look at this, and there's grain to the stone, and there's, there's some sort of movement that already exists in it, um, simply because it's something that has um, come from nature. Whereas a stretched canvas or a piece of paper is relatively flat, and though the composition of it may have come from materials made from nature, it doesn't necessarily have anything in it that of course it does. gives it something. And well, tell me about that because <laughs> I, you know, I I see it as just a flat surface of non-existence. <laughs> 
keep in mind, it's the images that you have on the canvas that comes from the artist, which came from nature. The stone is the artist's canvas. It just happens to be a stone, mm -hmm. and you create what you want on it. The only difference in a canvas, you're applying, you're putting the paint on, and stone sculpting, you're taking away. It's still from nature in the sense that I know you mean the canvas not being is man-made versus right. it's being nature, but the thought as to what goes into it is what create is is what makes it, and that is from nature because of what we see. What you see as a human being, as far as the sunset landscape, what I see as far as people that may be here, it all comes from nature. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's uh, that's pretty interesting. Although <laughs> I still somehow feel like. This speaks to me a little bit stronger than a piece of paper, but then again, I'm the one that's on this end interviewing <laughs> the artist. <laughs> Don, I know that you're very involved in the community uh, with uh, teaching a variety of courses in a variety of places in the city, and that you have also uh, done a great deal of exhibiting in the area. Tell us a little bit about your involvement in the community and some of the programs that you work on involving the children. First of all, I think I'd like to say there's a song, the very first line of the song says, the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. And that's how I feel about it. They are. It's the future right here, not me, not you, them. Right. So what all I'm, I'm selfish in a way because I like to live forever can't do it. So what do I do? Give it to them, give it to the children, and they can carry on. And as far as classes, private classes, the schools throughout Springfield, first of all, I love it. I love working mm -hmm. with the kids. And it's my responsibility as well as, I think, all adults to help them. I think that's wonderful. Um, it would be nice if more people would get a little bit more active in participating. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the specific programs that you work on? I know that you do a lot of work uh, with the Shriners. Yes. And I also know that you do a lot of work in taking children into your studio, and we'll be experiencing a little bit of that since we're in the midst of one of those classes as we speak. Yes, I'd like to say, first of all, as far as Shriners are concerned, I volunteer to go there every Monday. And I enjoy that, working mm -hmm. with the kids, because some are long-term, as far as their disability, they're long-term, and it's great for them. Also, Bay State Medical was nice enough, and I mean it, generous enough to allow us the space to hang some of the children's work, as well mm -hmm. as, as uh, mine and my brother's. But I just want to give a special thanks to them for that, and I'm pretty sure they're, uh, they know I appreciate it, and I just want to say that. I'm glad that you've done that, because Bay State has been a staunch advocate yes. for the arts. Um, in the community for many, many years. And uh, it's nice to know that they have a belief, as the Shriners do, that the aesthetic value of life is as important in the healing process as the advanced medical technology that exists today. So it's nice that you, and it is nice that they have a children's gallery also. Um, tell us a little bit about the students that you bring in here and, and some of the work that they might do, the media that you're teaching them. Are you teaching any of them sculpture? Absolutely. The children that come, I won't say children, I'll say students. Students, okay, <laughs> we'll say students. Come to my studio and they learn a variety <laughs> of uh, media as far as working with oil, acrylic, sculpting in clay, stone and wood. Uh, it's a, I have to honestly say the only problem is we don't have enough hours. <laughs> His classes are an hour and a half, and many of the children literally, when their parents come, they don't want to leave. They want more. I'm sure. Don't, uh, don't you find it exhilarating to find a young person begin to express themselves through uh, a <clears throat> means other than some of the things that they might be experiencing via other forms of entertainment, such as television? Without a doubt. That pretty much goes without saying. But keep one thing in mind as far as creativeness. The ability to create human beings are the only species, species that I know of that can actually create art, music, whatever. And that separates us from all other forms of life. So that's why, as you look around you, it's great to see the children creating in an artistic way, you know? Mm -hmm. I think what we want to do now is maybe get you in uh, with some of your students that are here today. It would be nice to take advantage of that so that our audience can 
actually see Great. how you interact with them and how you hopefully are becoming an inspiration to them Thank as you. somebody inspired you when you were younger. Very good. Thank you. Okay, what we're working on here is a floral composition with Jennifer. What I'd like for you to do, Jennifer, is to realize that the deeper you go into here, you're going to have heavy shadows. So some of the dark that you're putting here, make sure you add green and black into here lightly okay. so it shows the depth in it. Brianna is working on an abstract piece here. What's the title of this, Brianna? Would you tell me, please? Just the hand, but just the hand symbolizing from one hand what you can do as far as art, as far as anything in life. Very good. I like the color choice. Don't forget, though, to put shadows between the fingers. Highlights go last. You want to make sure you put all your shadows first, and at the end, put whatever highlights you have. Go ahead. What, the, what we're working toward the children have been involved in, a, uh, in a, the home show, 99, at which point we had a, a fundraiser for the uh, children's study home. What we're doing now is preparing for the next fundraiser, which will be part of uh, the 99 fundraiser, go right into the year 2000. It's important, in my opinion, to have these students not only hone their skills and better their artwork, but to be uh, community conscious. What's important, Tracy, right here, is your vanishing point. You, you're going to util utilize that point, not only for your river, but also for your trees, meaning your smaller trees will be here, coming this way. You know, this is a straight line. I'd like for you, and use your smaller brush here. Use that. And as you come towards yourself, you want that feeling that you're going to walk right into this path here. Make your smaller trees and your strokes larger as you come towards yourself. Preferably use a lighter color here later. You can use that for now, but darker toward this end. Go ahead. Do you have a title for this painting? No. <laughs> is this the first or is this a... a uh, first, I've done a smaller painting of this. Now I just want to make it bigger on canvas. Okay. I put a little more paint on there. This is excellent. What's really important, and I, I enjoy the fact that the children participate not only for themselves, but they were eager to join me in the fundraiser for the children's study home. Quite a few of the children sold their work, and they raised a total of almost three and a half thousand dollars in a period of one week. You know, and I, I appreciate the community at large that helps us with that, but the benefit, the actually, I should compliment the kids because they did it without the children. We would have had no show. Rachel has an abstract piece here she's working on, and I'd like for you to lighten up a bit, Rachel, by taking your white, using your white to put more in the center here, and, okay? And after that, add a little light around the fringes of that. I'd like to talk to David. David, this is a great composition. If you, if you really like, I'd like to show this. The composition of David's work is excellent, and he has a natural knack for laying out his work and being able to feel exactly where everything should be to create the feeling of movement. Uh, I'd like for you to take dark purple, though. You have your purple, and right under the belly of this fish, come around with a dark line, approximately a quarter inch. What, he, what David's doing, he's putting a shadow right under the fish, which will give it an extra dimension. Do the same thing and make it probably twice as thick as you have it, David. Go back again, and then from there, I want you to blend that. And right at the tail, where the tail and body meet, right there, make it, make, there you go, make it darker. Okay, very good, continue around. Now take your finger, David, and start to blend, pulling down, like so. It's an excellent job. Very good. I'd like for you to put extra white here and do the same thing. Make Use very small strokes, just barely blend. The excess chalk, you leave it right on the paper, you use that for blending. Now, David, if you'll do the same thing under the, on the lower fish.
Don, we, it's, it's really great being out here, a beautiful day, yes, and, it is. and I'm excited to, to have you tell me about this piece and to watch you work a little. Hey, it, it is exciting for me to tell you about this. I love, I love sculpting in wood as well as stone, but this piece represents mankind in general as a family. I'm going to call this the family mankind. That's great. You have your tools here. Why don't you tell me how you approach this? Well, first of all, we have a huge block of cedar, white Say it's cedar, big. and it's huge. One piece. Many people ask, is that one or two pieces? You know, glued together or one? And you start with this, keeping your tool super sharp. And when I say super sharp, I mean super sharp. You simply, what I've done over the past six months to a year is saturate this with oil. That prevents any cracking other than what's there. Just from the top, I pour oil. That's what you're looking at here. Then I come in and I, I'll start to peel that layer off. As you can see right there, I just went right over that. But the oil is, it just doesn't show as much, but this is saturated with it. And then from there, after I peel that layer off, I'll start to put the features in. What type of oil is that? It's just a regular three-in-one oil. It could be motor oil for a car, any oil. It, it really doesn't matter. It has so when you ask for an oil lube filter job, you ask them to save what's absolutely. drained out. <laughs> and I put it on here. But it does. It really preserves the piece. How do you sharpen your instruments and keep them in good, uh, good shape? Good question, Jim. And it's so important to have your tool sharpened. For example, here we have approximately a 35 degree angle on the bevel of that chisel. You would, when you would put your oil or water, some use the water, onto the stone, flint stone, press until you see. Now you see the water start to move or the oil move. Now you know you're flush with that. Right. And you keep that right at that angle when you're sharpening then lightly take the burrs off by hitting that side. And how often do you have to sharpen it if you're working? Depends on how you, if you're, if I'm here working and I work eight hours, every three hours or so, four hours, I may stop and sharpen it. Okay. Great question, Phil. When you're working like this, you, of course, you, you already, in my mind, I know exactly where and how, how deep to make any cuts. You almost have to have it laid out. At times I'll make marks on something, and that just basically tells me what I want to save or get rid of. I was reading about sculpting once about Michelangelo, and he described the, the work existing within the stone or the wood, and all he did was free it <laughs> so that other people could see it. It's a great analogy, and I have to say I agree with him. I feel that it's already in here. The only thing I'm doing is freeing it, letting yeah. it out. Don, tell me about how you work on this painting. What are you using? What kind of medium? This is oil, but it's in an oil bar. Your conventional oil, just like the uh, old artist would use, could take six months to dry. could take a year to fully dry, depending on how thick you put the oil on. An oil bar, Jim, is like a giant crayon, but it's oil. The only difference, you have a drying agent in here, which allows this to dry in a couple of days. And it's really great because you, it, it's free. You're free to work with it. A form. What happens overnight, you'll have a film that forms over the paint, which acts as a tube. You just remove the film, and you can go right in, and you can add your color. Say, for example, if I want a lighter color here, for you can add your color. You can also blend it well with your hands. So this is kind of an adult form of finger painting. Exactly. And it's therapy, good therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's like, that's a good analogy, like finger painting. And it works, and it's cleaner, much cleaner than your conventional oil. I've had an opportunity to use oil bars as well as paint with a brush, and I find that the oil bars gives you a lot of freedom to, to be a little looser in your painting. Much more, much more. I think that's because you're directly, rather than your palette and then your the paint thinner or mineral spirits to the brush to this, then over, you're going directly right to it without hesitation. Boom, it's on there. Now if I want to come in with a light, I don't have to mix colors there. I can take a white, for example, and put here for a highlight coming in. It's much faster to me. It's much simpler and it's more efficient. It's a lot of fun, too. It always makes me think of uh, my childhood crayon box. That's it. Absolutely. I have to agree with that. Well, this is beautiful. So is this one completed or, or nearly complete? Where? Well, how far along are you? Actually, the dark sections you see, I, I overlaid this meaning the dark part, some of it will show through just the shadows. I, what I'll do is put some detail into it. I'll finish the trees here, 
bring everything out with a dark coating in here, and then I would consider it done. It looks great. Thank you. Don, it was great visiting you. And, Before we uh, close, uh, uh, why don't Thank you tell you, us Thank where you. some of these people might be able to see your work, uh, where it might be in a contract. public space, not yes. necessarily yes. on exhibit, oh. but where it might be Does in a collection. Does he need you at home And then also how they can get in touch with you, whether it's to see some of your work or even to take a class. I think the best thing, Carla, to do is uh, probably call the studio. Mm -hmm. And, of course, my studio, Distinctive Art, the phone number is 782-2608. There's a gallery called the Sheep Gate, which I do have work there, and I intend to have sculpture and paintings there mm -hmm. throughout the year. Oh, good. <laughs> Don, I want to thank you very much for allowing us to come in here today and to see your studio, to talk to you, to learn a little bit about what exactly it is that makes Don Blanton the wonderful artist that he is. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. And Carla, this has been really exciting visiting with Don today. This has been a great visiting, watching him not only work on his own artwork, but teach his students. I think it was thrilling. It was exciting to hear him talk about how he takes uh, raw material and creates something that it's so ex aesthetically pleasing and expressive. I know we'll have to listen harder so that the stones will start speaking <laughs> to us. No, the stone is one thing. Having a canvas speak is another thing. That I have a problem with. But um, I hope you all enjoyed this segment and our initial program. And we are looking forward to a visit to the studio of Heidi Kutu, who's in the Indian Orchard Mills. And I hope that you'll join us for that next segment. And until then, thank you very much. And Jim, I'm looking forward to the next visit. So let's be on our way. Great. See you next <laughs> time. No, just me. I want some oh. time my lipstick goes in there.